Hey, it's Brock here with Rock Hill Farms, and this is my John Deere 2038R with 650 hours on it. Now in this video, I want to go over my favorite things about it, the things I don't care for about it, how I think it compares to other tractors in the John Deere lineup in terms of price and performance, and how I think it might compare to some other manufacturers. I've done a lot of modifications to this tractor. I'm going to go over those, how well they've worked, and just how well I think this tractor does at a lot of different tasks. So we'll jump into that right now, and I'm going to show you a lot of the work I've done with it, and then I'll walk through my opinions on it. In this clip, I'm going to carry 1,500 pounds of firewood across a pretty nasty mud hole without any problems. But I wanted to throw in one thing that I forgot to mention that is a big selling point to me on this tractor is I think they have the best design for installing and removing a tractor backhoe that I've seen. I can literally take it on and off within about two minutes. Same thing with the mid-mount mower, which is a drive-over deck, and even the loader. John Deere has absolutely nailed those three things in terms of how easy they are to take on and off.
But as you can see, I do a lot with my tractor. 650 hours and 90% of those hours were pushing it pretty hard. I'm usually asking a lot of this machine and running a lot of implements that require every bit of the horsepower it has. And I've also weighed this tractor down to over double the listed weight. I think I've got pretty thorough sample size on what it can handle. And I watch a lot of tractor review videos and this type of content, and people always say, this thing's done everything I've ever asked it to do. Well, I wouldn't say that. I think that's a cliche thing. I try to do all kinds of things that this machine can't do because it's a compact tractor. Now, in a lot of cases, it will do them just slower. But I actually got a skid loader for some of the heavier lifting I do and some higher reach and things like that. But let's talk about, first, the stock tractor because I ran it for 100 hours before really doing any modifications on it. And it was just an open station. I really, I loved this tractor from day one. And I've driven a lot of other tractors in the John Deere lineup and some from other manufacturers. And I'm going to say this is the most well-designed ergonomic tractor I've ever operated. As far as balance and placement of all your controls, comfort to operate. Now, when I compare this to a 1025, 2025, and 3046, I think that's a pretty good range of models to compare it to. And in each one, when you go up, you see a big price difference. $4,000, $6,000, $8,000 increase to go from one model to the next. And you would expect for that, I mean, you're almost guaranteed you're going to see performance increases. This tractor was dramatically more capable than a 2025. And quite a bit less capable than a 3046 in terms of lift capacity and clearance and just you know, the 3046 has bigger tires. It's got more horsepower to the PTO. It's just a more capable machine. But the question that anyone buying a tractor has to look at is within that range, you can start with a garden tractor that doesn't have a loader, you know, and just a PTO, and it's very inexpensive, and you can do things with it. Those are handy. You could get an old Ford 8N for... You know, a couple thousand dollars that you can do all kinds of work with. Or you can spend a half a million dollars on a giant ag tractor. Somewhere in that range, you've got to find the point that suits what you want to do. And for me and what I want to do, this has been a fantastic tractor. It honestly has. Now, I, I try to make money with my equipment, and I think I push it a little harder than probably the average person. And for me, the perfect tractor is probably in the 50 to 60 horsepower range. But that's a very, that's, that range of tractors going to cost twice what this one does. So it's all about where you want to be in the market. So let's look specific things on this tractor that I like. I talked about ergonomics. We'll spend just a minute on that. First, I don't want to be negative towards any brand because I think all the tractor companies make a good machine. About the only thing I don't like is the Kubota treadle pedal. And that's personal preference. A lot of guys love it. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just what you prefer. I will say on the dual pedal machines, having run a 2025 and a 3046 and a few other tractors, these are perfectly placed. If you see right here, my heel is on the ground. And I can push that pedal with my heel on the ground. On the 3046, I had to lift my foot up to get it on the pedals. Just little things, right? Operator station on this side. My elbow's on the armrest. I'm not... So, it's fine. I've ran tractors where you reached out here to run it. But this is perfect to me. Okay? And loader controls, three-point control, your auxiliary hydraulic controls, PTO, mower deck height, mower deck height, mower deck raise and lower. 
placement on all of these is fantastic. It's, it's ergonomic. Then on this side, you have this robust emergency brake. That's locked in hard. It never tries to move on me no matter what I do. And it's very easy in and out. Same thing with the shifter. In gear, out of gear. That's every time. I've been on a lot of tractors where it's kind of hard to get it in and out of gear. This one, every time smooth. Okay. And your four wheel drive right here. It's easy to reach, but it is a little bit hard to get in gear. You have to sometimes let the tractor roll just a little bit to engage it. And then your diff lock is right here. Diff lock. Now if you're interested on the cab, I just did a long-term two-year review on this Curtis Advantage cab. It's not quite the same as having a factory cab, but it's so much less expensive than a factory cab. I give high marks to this Curtis cab. Not going to talk about it because I just reviewed it. You can check that video out. I'll link to it at the end. Okay, now let's talk about this loader. Because I didn't buy the tractor with this loader, I bought it with the standard 220R loader. This is a mechanical self-leveling loader. Switching to this loader has been a massive upgrade to the tractor. Now there are people who don't like it, but I've done a full review on that too. Just a dedicated video to the differences with the loader, but I'll summarize it real quick. On the 2 Series tractors, when you go to this self-leveling loader, you gain like 400 pounds of lift capacity. That's a 40% increase. It's dramatic. I can lift 1,700 or 1,800 pounds an inch off the ground, and at full height, I don't remember, so I don't want to say it wrong, but at a working range, 14, 1,500 pounds, you can get it up and set it in a truck bed or on a trailer. That is a huge lift capacity for a tractor this size, being a small frame machine. So the extra lift capacity is great, but also it's just phenomenal. If you've ever ran anything that self-levels up and self-levels down, you just can't beat it. I mean, even on the skid loader, it self-levels up, but not on the way down. And that's an annoyance for me, really. And, you know, you can use it. It's all about what you pay. You pay only $600 extra for the self-leveling. Now, the reason some people don't like it is you have less total curl back. So, I don't remember the numbers, so I'm not going to say angles, but there's a curl back angle that you normally get on your bucket that lets you totally fill that bucket. Through the, just the geometry of the way they made this mechanically self-level, you lose a little bit of curl back. So instead of your bucket coming back to here, it only comes back to here. And the first time you use it, you're going to be annoyed because you're getting less material in that bucket. And I compensated for that by getting an oversized bucket. And so I'm still getting a full load. And it, with the extra lift capacity, it can handle that oversized bucket. So for some people, that curl back thing is a big deal. There's a fairly simple modification you can do to get your curl back back. It requires some fabrication. And there's one guy online who's been doing it. But it's basically a spacer on each side that pushes the bottom of your bucket out and still uses your John Deere Quick Connect. So, but for me, it hasn't even been worth doing that. It's not that big a deal. So the next thing while we're up here at the loader is an annoyance for me, which is a lack of third function. This model of the 2038, this redesign has been out for five years and they just recently came out with a true factory third function. That is not that much to ask for, in my opinion, for a tractor in this price range to come with factory third function option. And it didn't when I bought mine. At this point, I could add it, but I have a diverter kit from Artillion and works fine. But I was a little disappointed that they didn't originally have that. I guess it's not that relevant if you're looking to get one because now, today, you can get it that way from your dealer. Next thing while we're up here on the loader, John Deere Quick Attach. I think it's better than the skid steer quick attach. But with that said, I think they should stop making it. Even though it's 10% better, it's an annoyance that if you own more than one tractor, your implements are not interchangeable. 
I think standardizing attachment systems is, it just, it needs to happen. It's, there's no excuse for different manufacturers to have their own proprietary attachment system. So I think John Deere should get in line with everyone else and put skid steer quick attach on their loaders. And I know why they do it. It is better. It's a little bit easier. It's, it's foolproof and it's lighter. So on a small tractor, you're saving weight. My opinion though, it's complicated, but my opinion is they should switch to skid steer quick attach. Let's see, what else have we done on the front? I added a custom grill guard. I think that would be a great option if you could order it from the factory with a grill guard. I did a video where we fabricated the grill guard and put on here. Really not that much work and not that much expense if you have fabricating skills. Last thing on the front of the tractor is broken bolts. A lot of people have problems with loose and broken bolts on the front axle. I have not had that problem, but something to keep in mind. And every tractor manual from every manufacturer will tell you that periodically you go through and re-torque all your bolts to make sure they're not coming loose. The fact that major bolts like that can come loose is just an accepted fact in the tractor world. The only problem I've had in that kind of category, I've actually had two, honestly. And the first was the bolts that hold the loader on, and I think that was on my original loader. They came loose, and I didn't notice it immediately. A couple of them broke, and I had to have those fixed, but it's never been a problem again. Now I check them. Second thing is you've got washers on some of these pivot points on the self-leveling loader. After... 100 hours running the self-leveling loader, some of those came loose, and I had to take it, well, I could have done it myself. I understand what to do, but it's under warranty, and that loader was new, and I just took it back to the dealership and had them fix it to make sure it was right, and they replaced all that. They replaced the washers that go behind the bolts, and they Loctited those. I have a separate video just on the issue with those, those uh, bolts coming loose in the loader. Okay, moving on from the loader. I don't like how small these front tires are. Not even, I'm six foot tall, but that front tire doesn't even come up to my knee. That once again goes into the category of it's a small tractor, but I hate how small those front tires are. And actually the rear tires are pretty small for 38 horsepower and how much it can lift needs bigger tires. Another thing I've made a video about is tractor rollovers and how prevalent it is to have a tractor rollover, especially like with the 1025s, those are even more tippy than, than this model is, but I wasn't going to allow that. And I've made a whole video on things I think are good advice to prevent tractor rollover. But one thing is adding as much ballast as possible. And I know there's such a thing as too much ballast, and I'm gonna talk about that. But I've got fluid in the front tires, which doesn't add up to much. I've got fluid in the rear tires. I've got wheel weights. I've got the backhoe subframe. I always run three-point ballast, and if I don't have a specific ballast, I've at least got a three-point attachment on it. And stock, the specs say this tractor weighs like 2,500 pounds. I've weighed mine with a heavy attachment like the stump grinder or the flail mower. I've weighed mine in at almost 6,000 pounds. Now, 400 pounds of that is the cab, which is actually up high enough that it moves your center of gravity up. So that's not really beneficial weight. The downsides to weighing your tractor down like that. I weigh mine down as heavy as I possibly could. The downsides, number one, you're going to sink more driving it through your yard. So if you mow your yard with it a lot, you're not going to want to fully ballast it like this. But I didn't set my tractor up for mowing. I set it up for how much can I lift, how much can I pull. Every bit of weight you can put on it is the answer for that. Now with all that weight on there, and I've had that weight on there most of the time I've owned the tractor, I've went through a lot of stuff and I've never gotten stuck in this machine. Pretty good. Does pretty good about that. And I guess there are times when I've just made a smart choice not to go in an area that would have got stuck. But 
I'm pretty happy with that aspect of it. The negative I've found for me to that much weight is running this flail mower with a 6,000 pound load on this small tractor, it's taking half of the horsepower the tractor has to get it up the hill. So I have to mow pretty slow because that flail mower requires a lot of horsepower. It's mulching the material. So I really had to go slow uphill, going downhill, I could drive a lot faster. And that's just a factor of I'm using all of the horsepower this machine has. So in terms of front end lift capacity, I think we're doing pretty good. The three point lift capacity is a big fail in my opinion. This is a 38 horsepower tractor. If you look across the entire tractor world at 38 horsepower tractors. Number one, this will be the smallest machine that you find with 38 horsepower. So that, that's a factor, but every other th tractor you're going to find with this horsepower is going to have at least twice the rear lift capacity. This has a, maybe not quite that much, but this has a 1300 pound rated lift capacity on the three point, and most of them will be 2100, 2500, something like that and something to be aware of i had to trade out this flail mower not because my horsepower couldn't spin it but because the previous flail mower i had weighed 1200 pounds and when you bring that weight back here i couldn't lift it off the ground so something to be aware of another thing i think that deer should make standard on this is these extendable draft arms i've done a a whole video on why I think these extendable draft arms are, are a great upgrade. You can use a extendable draft arm from a 3025 on here, and that's what I'm doing, and I've been doing it for a long time. Works great, but it should be an option. If it's available on a 3E with the same part number, it should be available on the 2038. I also think they should have telescoping stabilizers. I upgraded to aftermarket telescoping stabilizers, and personally, I had an issue with them. I've detailed that issue already. I switched back to the stock stabilizers. When I bought the machine, I added two sets of rear remotes. That's what the two levers in the operator station are. Those work perfectly. Couldn't do half of the stuff I do without them. Great add-on if you've got the ability to add those rear remotes done direct from the factory. And like I said a second ago, the fact you can control them so easily from the location of those levers is very convenient. Fuel fill. I really like the location of the fuel fill. It's a very convenient place to refill as opposed to on the hood or a lot of other places I've seen them. So that's a win. A negative I see, and I see this with a lot of tractors, but there's very little tool storage on this tractor. And I've got two really nice tool storage options that I've added aftermarket. One is the Artillion tool rack. And it's actually not on here at the moment, but it's a bar that goes across your ROPS, lets you put a variety of different attachments on the ROPS. Second thing is this ITC saw boss. Well, it's really not the saw boss. ITC stands for Interchangeable Tool Carrier. This is a chainsaw holder but I can pull a pin, lift that right off, put a toolbox in the same spot, and a variety of other attachments that you can put right on here. So I don't like that you have to add your own toolbox, but if you're gonna do it, at least there's some really nice aftermarket options. So all of this is, really a lot of it's nitpicky kind of stuff. Um, what it really comes down to, if you're looking to spend your hard earned money on a tractor, but I recommend you buy this one. And I touched on this at the beginning, but you've got to make a list. In my mind, I would make a list of things I anticipated doing. You know, am I moving logs? Am I moving firewood? Am I tilling? Am I, am I brush cutting? And what are the lift capacity requirements of that task? What is the horsepower requirements of that task? And then start looking at machine prices after that. This is the latest redesign John Deere has done. They redesigned this machine four or five years ago. 
all of their, like all the three series tractors, their last redesign on those was 15 years ago. So when they do a redesign on the 3R tractor, I bet it's going to be a big upgrade. But this is the most recent, and you can feel it in the ergonomics. But if, if you look at your list of things you're going to do, and a 1025 will do all of them, you know, why would you spend an extra ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000, whatever the number is, on this machine? But for a lot of you, maybe this isn't even capable enough. So it's about finding a spot where you want to jump in. Now, I feel like the gap from the 2025 to the 2038 is bigger than the gap to go up to a 3046. Personal opinion, I feel like this machine feels like a 3 Series to me. And I, it's definitely a lot more capable machine than most of the 3E tractors. Now, I've not ran like a 3038E or anything like that to compare it to. So I'd love to get the opportunity to get my hands on a 3038E for a day with the operator or the owner of that machine and compare these head to head. But until that happens, I will just say that it seems like there's an arms race to see who can make the largest 25 horsepower machine. And... So I don't want to speak for all manufacturers, but like the Deer 3025E doesn't have near the lift capacity of the 2038. So you just have to be aware of all these things. Do your research because there's so much of an investment being put into a machine like this. You want to get the right one. I think every manufacturer makes a great machine. I do not regret for a second getting this machine, but I would honestly like to have something in the 50 to 60 horsepower range for myself just because of what I do now and what I'm looking to do in the future. I was intending to make this a really short video and somehow it's gotten really long, but serviceability on the tractor is great. It's a great machine. Love having it. Appreciate you taking time to watch. I'll put links on the screen to a couple more of our videos and I'll see you next time.